Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition of 153greatfish.website. It's an exciting lesson tonight. We're going to talk about the, the Isaiah scroll that was found at Qumran. Um, this is a, a three-part lesson. Uh, it's going to take a little while to go through it, but after you learn it, you're going to have ammunition and something to pray about. Let's begin by prayer. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Mighty God, we ask you to bless our Bible study tonight. Open the doors and the windows of heaven, Lord, for all the people that are listening today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, straight to the PowerPoint, and here we go. The Isaiah Scroll of Qumran. The Isaiah Scroll of Qumran. Here's our outline tonight. The last sign that's going to occur before Jesus physically returns to root to Jerusalem. We need to be uh, aware that there will be one final sign. Then Jesus returns immediately after this sign. We want to look at the missionary text of the Isaiah scroll. This text actually split synagogues from 33 to 130 AD. And uh, this was the primary uh, document that the uh, early Christians used to create a Jewish church. And then, of course, a Gentile church. We're going to explore five timelines in uh, the short uh, sub-series of the Isaiah, book of Isaiah. Number one, we're going to look at the Septuagint tonight, and that's going to take most of our lesson here tonight. Next week, we'll talk about the Zedekite priests of Qumran. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Jews, the Aleppo Codex. These are timelines, by the way, the Aleppo Codex and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the State of Israel. So we have five timelines to look at. We're just going to go over this one tonight. It's a pretty fascinating uh, study. And then the Great Isaiah Scroll and the Restoration of Israel. That'll be our summation uh, in this Bible study. Can you say, praise the Lord? Well, let's talk about the last sign, the awakening of Israel. What's that all about? Well, here we go. The Bible says that the Jews would have a table of vomit. And this is the Talmud's coma, the Talmudic coma. This is found in Romans 11, 9 through 10, uh, quoting Psalm 69, 22. So why is the Jews' table full of vomit? The table of showbread was supposed to be in the tabernacle. You had to have the light, the seven uh, lamps of the menorah, in order to see the bread, in order to eat the bread. The daily bread is the word of God. And so their table has vomit on it. How did that happen? Well, it comes from the Talmud, which began in 200 AD, the Palestinian Talmud, and then 500 AD, the Babylonian Talmud, as Judaism tried to preserve their religion, that, of course, uh, Jesus had told them that their temple would be destroyed. Okay, every stone would, would be thrown down, and uh, that pretty much uh, destroyed uh, Judaism. The, uh, the Judaism that we have today, rabbinical Judaism, is a fake religion. It's totally fake news, and I'm going to talk about that tonight. Now, that's not an anti-Semitic remark. There's many Jewish Christians, there's many Jews that have come into the, the faith of Jesus Christ. This is not a polemic against Jews. This is a polemic against fake religion, fake religion. So, the Bible says that all Israel shall be saved. And, of course, Paul says this in Romans 11, 26 through 27. He is quoting Isaiah 59, 20 through 21. This is the last sign before the return of Jesus Christ physically, is that the Hebrews, the Jews, will enter into the Jesus name, Acts 2.38 church. How's that going to happen? Well, Zechariah 12 says there will be a great repentance in Jerusalem and in Israel. Something's going to trigger this repentance. It's my personal belief that they're going to discover that they've been involved in a fake religion and that uh, their rabbis have lied to them. They have manipulated the scriptures to keep them deceived, and that's all going to be exposed here shortly at the preaching of two witnesses. These two witnesses found in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, 1 through 14, will spend three and a half years in Jerusalem. And what they will do is they will expose the fact that rabbinical Judaism has hid their Messiah from the eyes of the Jewish people. There will be a great day of repentance, as said in Zechariah 12. And of course, they will call upon the name of Jesus. And of course, that name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Then Ezekiel talks about the valley of dry bones that are resurrected. It's my belief that this valley of dry bones is twofold. First, it talks about the resurrection from the dead at the great last day. But it really is talking about here 
Rabbinical Judaism is a valley of dry bones, and it needs to be resurrected. And this is going to happen at the preaching of the two witnesses. But just as Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, so will this fake religion crucify these two witnesses. Now, these two witnesses will have mouths of fire. And, of course, fire always represents the holiness of God. It represents the uh, kabod, the kabod, the Shekinah of God. They'll have mouths that will uh, demonstrate the uh, wisdom of God, all the gifts of the Spirit, all the anointing uh, of the Lord. And these guys are prophets similar to Moses and Elijah. I do not believe that these are actually the uh, reincarnated Moses and reincarnated Elijah. No, they're coming in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. It's an understanding of the Torah and, of course, the understanding of the prophets. I believe that's what the mouth of fire is. They're going to expose uh, the corruptions that have happened in rabbinical Judaism, why people, the Jewish people, have not come to faith in Jesus Christ is because they've been lied to, okay? Then, of course, they're going to have authority. Authority simply means piety plus exegesis of the word. In other words, piety means obedience to the commandments of God. Exegesis means the right understanding of the word. That's the authority they will come in. They will demonstrate all the gifts of the Spirit between these two people. Uh, we don't know if uh, they're groups or if they're individuals, but we know that they'll have a mouth of fire and authority. They're called the two olive trees in Revelation, which is a, uh, which is a uh, allusion to Zechariah chapter 4, where the Lord says, what are these two olive trees? Not by might nor by power, by my spirit, saith the Lord, talking about raising the temple of God. They're called two olive trees, which means they're the anointed ones. One certainly will be Davidic, one will be Aaronic. That's the Levites and the tribe of Judah. Those are the only two tribes that exist today. The other ten tribes have been absorbed into the Jewish nation long ago when they were carted off into Assyria in 722 B.C. and then replanted. So we know that the two witnesses will be Davidic and Aaronic, very much like Jesus, who is the son of David, and, of course, John the Baptist, who was Aaronic. And this is the ministry of Melchizedek, who is both Levite and Davidic. That's the, <laughs> Jesus is, an, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was the first Melchizedek priesthood. Anybody who's messianic, meaning Acts 2.38 Christian, is in fact a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Read Psalm 110 if you want to learn more about that. These two prophets will be killed just as, as rabbinical Judaism killed Jesus Christ uh, 2,017 years ago. So will they kill these two prophets for preaching the truth, and this will bring a great judgment and a great persecution upon all Christians worldwide when they kill these two prophets. This will be seen by the whole world. Uh, I don't know if they're going to cut their heads off, they're going to crucify them, I'm not exactly sure what they will do, but uh, after they do this, the Bible calls Jerusalem Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, the city of Sodom, for rejecting their prophets and killing their prophets. Read Hebrews 11.37 because it's possible that they did in fact, uh, Manasseh did kill uh, Isaiah. And so will these Manasseh type uh, people kill these two great witnesses in the city of Jerusalem. And then the second woe of persecution uh, commences and it precedes the third woe of global judgment. And that's what happens after these two guys are destroyed. And they're caught up to heaven, which is no doubt the rapture. So we have a missionary text in the book of Isaiah and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the book of Isaiah and how it was used to convert synagogues to Christianity from 33 to 133 A.D. And the key chapters that they used to do this were Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 60. These eight chapters all have tremendous messianic reference to Jesus Christ. And these were used to evangelize the synagogues but something happened. Now, what I'm going to do is just go through a few of these scriptures, and you'll be able to stop the video on the replay, or maybe want to write some of these down. These are all the scriptures that refer to Jesus Christ. And, of course, the, the rabbis had to actually change the book of Isaiah. They had to create a falsified version of it in order to get rid of these verses for what they really mean. And that's the purpose of this Bible study tonight, is to prove that the rabbis changed the book of Isaiah to write Jesus out of it, and I'm going to explain to you how they did this. So here we go. This verse here, Isaiah 7:14, a virgin shall conceive. Now we're going to go into this verse in detail. 
The Jews, the rabbis, changed this to get rid of the word virgin. The reason is they wanted to discredit the, the missionaries that were coming into the synagogues, and they did this about 136, 130 A.D. Uh, the Galilean ministry of Jesus is, is found in Isaiah 9.3, uh, confirmed by Mark 4.16. Isaiah 9, 6 says that Jesus would be a son of David, a prince, the everlasting and mighty God. Uh, certainly, it isn't just the Jews that don't like this scripture. It's many people that believe in the Trinity. They don't want to call Jesus the everlasting and the mighty God. He's both father and son. Jesus is the only God you can see. He's the only father you can see. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the father. If you get to heaven and see more than one person as the father, then Jesus lied because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And uh, he's the only father we can see. He's the father manifest in flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, Isaiah 9, 7, 11, 1, 11, 10, he's an heir to David's throne. Isaiah 11, 12, the spirit of God rests upon him. Isaiah 11, 4 through 5, he's granted authority to judge the earth. 43 through 5, his way will be prepared. Of course, that was done in John 1, 19 through 28 by John the Baptist. He will be disfigured and suffer. Now, this is the, the key scripture that the rabbis tried to discredit. And they tried to reinterpret the Isaiah scroll to get rid of Jesus. So instead of he, uh, a he being uh, the one who suffers, they want to insert the word they suffer, meaning uh, the Jews themselves. So they want to substitute Israel instead of Messiah in these scriptures, uh, 52, 12 through 53, approximately uh, 13. So be aware of that, that they tried to change the uh, book of Isaiah to read that way. And we're going to be able to identify how they did this uh, in uh, this series. So Jesus makes atonement with his blood, 1 Peter 1, 2. And of course, they try to turn this into Israel makes atonement with their blood instead of he makes atonement with his blood. They try to change it to a plural. You can't do it. And the reason is the Dead Sea Scrolls have proven that that cannot be changed. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, he's going to bear our sins. 6 through 8, he's going to take our place, a substitute. Romans 5, 6 through 8. 53, 7, silent before his accusers, and he will die with criminals in 53, 12. In 61 through 2, he will heal the brokenhearted. So what they did is they, they wanted to make uh, everything that related to the Messiah to be uh, a, a, uh, an allusion to Israel itself versus he, the singular Messiah. And that's the corruption that they try to introduce in the scriptures. And to this day, this is what they preach in their synagogues, trying to convince their people that Jesus is not the Messiah. But of course, that is a lie. He is the Messiah. And that we know because now as Gentiles, we, we've come into the church. And there are many Jews who have seen this truth and have come in as well. Septuagint timeline. Why is the Septuagint important? The Septuagint simply means the translation of the 70. Nobody really knows if 70 people translated it, but we do know that the word Septuagint is the Greek word for the Old Testament. Now, this is the book that is in dispute. You're going to see what they tried to do uh, to get rid of this because the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, ends up being a dictionary for the Hebrew autographs, the Masoretic text. And they don't want you to know this, that the Septuagint, even though it's a translation, is in fact a dictionary. Now, the only way that the devil can fool us is by changing the dictionary, not the autographs. So we're not worried about the Masoretic text, whether it's corrupted or not per se. We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that have confirmed that the Masoretic text is 99% accurate. And uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a thousand years older and original versus the Masoretic text. There's a story about how the Masoretic text got created. And we're going to go into that here in the next sessions, the next couple, uh, next couple uh, lessons. But tonight, we're just going to focus on the timeline of the Septuagint. What happened to it? How did it get created? Etc. So we're going to begin here. In 586 B.C. at the Babylonian crisis when Nebuchadnezzar was attacking uh, Jerusalem, the Jews that were left behind, that were left in the land, the Lord gave a word to Jeremiah that they were to stay in the land and God would prosper them. But they were worried that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come back. And so they ran to Egypt and they took Jeremiah with them by force. He had given them a word of warning in Jeremiah 42 through 44, but they didn't listen. They said, first they asked him, inquire of the Lord what, what we should do. Then they said, okay, we don't like that word. So we believe you're lying. We're going to take you to Egypt. That, we're going to do what we want to anyway. That's what they did. So that's how Jews got into Egypt again. So Egypt then was conquered by Alexander the Great and he founded the great city of Alexandria, which bears his name. 
and he did this between 332 and 331 BC. After he did this, a Greek dialect of the city of Alexandria, it had its own idioms. It's like High German versus Low German, okay? It was Greek, but it, was, it had some Coptic influences in it. Uh, Coptic, of course, was the language of uh, ancient Egypt, and uh, it came to be known as Coptic Christianity as well, and it still had some of the hieroglyphs involved in it, and so we're going to see that's going to become important later on in this study here in just a few seconds. So then Jews began to immigrate to Alexandria because it was a city with a great library and liberty from 586 to 285, those 300 years. Eventually, there were more Jews in Alexandria than there was in Jerusalem. And of course, this is what God was trying to avoid. However, what they did was that they created their own translation of the Old Testament. This is called the Alexandrian Idiom Septuagint. Idiom means there is some local variety of the Greek language in Alexandria. And they created their own Septuagint translation. This is a Greek Old Testament, which made it a dictionary because now we have Western words that interpret the Hebrew words. And it was made from the Alexandrian Greek and it was presented to the king of Egypt by the Jewish population. And of course, it ended up in that great library of Alexandria. And this is the book that everybody is looking for. It's been lost. And uh, it was burned at one of the libraries. And this is what we are all looking for. And I'm going to give you a clue where it's at tonight. And this is very important why we need to find it and identify it. In 250 BC, this, uh, uh, this uh, Greek Septuagint that they created, I call it the ADI. Why do I call it the ADI? Alexandrian Greek uh, idiom. Okay, So it's got the Alexandrian Greek idiom Septuagint. It becomes the dictionary witness of the Hebrew text. So it's our dictionary. <laughs> Where's it at? It's been lost, folks, and here's why. 95 AD, this, this Septuagint, it became the Old Testament text of the diaspora Jews and the Gentile Christians. The Greek language had become lingua franca. In other words, it became the uh, language of the Middle East and Asia because Greek dominated everything around the Mediterranean. Just like English today dominates the business world, Greek dominated uh, the business world uh, of that time. So the AGI, this is the old Septuagint of 250 BC. This is the book that they used to convert people in the synagogue to Christianity through all those uh, verses that I showed you that Jesus is the Messiah. So the New Testament writers quote mostly from this old version and the synagogues were split by these Christians by using the book of Isaiah. You can read in Acts 8, 27 through 40. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 53 and he asks Philip, the evangelist, who is this referring to? And Philip explains to him, it's Jesus. And so we see that this is the key evangelism tool for winning Jews to Christianity, to Jesus Christ. However, if you're a rabbi and you want to keep Jews from entering into Christianity, you got to do something about this. So they concocted a scheme to change this old Septuagint into a new version, a corrupted version, that, so it would not say Jesus Christ when they read those scriptures. So in 126 AD, a rabbi named Akiba, this is probably one of the most uh, revered rabbis in rabbinical Judaism, he hires a polyglot. Polyglot is a man who knows many languages. He was a Gentile named Akilo, also known as Ankelos. He was involved in, in creating the uh, Palestinian Talmud in Targums, and uh, he's the one that was hired by Akiba to retranslate the Hebrew text into a Koine Greek, in other words, to create a new Septuagint. We're going to call that the KG Septuagint, uh, which is the Koine Greek Septuagint, which is definitely different from the Alexandrian Greek idiom Septuagint. And so when they replaced it with this, they handed a copy of this to Jerome, the Catholic, because he was one to learn Hebrew, and he created the Vulgate out of it. So this KG Septuagint is different from the AGI Septuagint, the old Septuagint in the book of Isaiah. They changed the dictionary. That's what they did. They hired Aquila to falsify the Septuagint so it didn't say Jesus. Praise the Lord. We're exposing that tonight. So this, this corrupted Septuagint, the KG Septuagint of Aquila and Akiba, it changed the, ha the translation of the Hebrew word Ha-Alma. Now, this word is found in Isaiah 7:14. This is the Hebrew version of it, Ha-Alma. They changed it. Originally, in the old Septuagint, it was Pathinos, and they changed it to Viennes. Why? Why would they change it to, from this word to that word in their new translation? You're going to find this very interesting. 
So the original and the older AGI Septuagint of 250 had translated Ha'alma of the Hebrew as Parthenos in the Greek. That's what was in the original Septuagint. Why were they so interested in changing this word? Because Ha'alma in 250 BC means virgin. Parthenos means virgin. So if you change Parthenos to Vianus, it no longer means virgin. It means young woman or maiden. That was why they changed it because it said in Luke 137 that a virgin would conceive in the New Testament. They were trying to make the New Testament look like a false document. That's why Achilles changed it. Isn't that rotten? <laughs> I don't like it. So Jerome, okay, in the fourth century, he was learning Hebrew from rabbinical teachers. They introduced him to Achilles' revised Greek translation of 126 AD. And Jerome unwittingly adopted it in 382 AD and he replaced the original Greek Septuagint text with Achilles' retranslation into his Latin Vulgate. Okay, into his Latin Vulgate. So what did he do? Well, when he saw that the New Testament, Luke 137, said virgin, he forced the Old Testament that he was using, Akiba and Achilles' translation, where it said Vianus, he forced it back to say Parthenos. He, uh, he, he, was, he was in a conundrum. He was in cognitive dissonance. Why the two words were different between the New Testament and the Old. So just want to warn you that the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate that's in the Vatican, is based upon this corrupt translation of the Septuagint. Hey, this is good news, huh? So as this corrupt Septuagint of Aquila and Akiba began competing with the older Septuagint due to Jerome's Latin translation, it was immediately attacked by Christian churches due to the changes that Aquila had made. Yeah, they began to attack it. Here's what a bishop said in 140 AD. Irenaeus, a bishop, a Christian bishop of Lyon, France. Yeah, they had a church in Lyon. He was a writer of this book, against heresies, and this is found in book three in chapter 21, he criticizes these two translators. Theodotion was a translator, he was an Ephesian, he was a Gentile who the uh, rabbis hired to make a translation, and Aquila of Pontus, that's northern Asia Minor, more, northern Turkey, right on the banks of the Black Sea. Aquila of Pontus, the guy we've been talking about, they were both Jewish proselytes of Gentile origin, and they succumbed to rabbinical pressure and making the change of Parthenos to Vianus. Therefore, Isaiah 7.14 is corrupt in the Jewish Bibles even today because of the Greek Old Testament translations, because the Old Testament of the, of the Greek, the Septuagint, is the dictionary for the Hebrew. Okay, keep that in mind. So your name is removed from the book of life if you change the Bible, Deuteronomy 4.2 and in Revelation 22. However, that's not what they did. They changed the dictionary not the autographs. They think they got away with it, don't they? They didn't. I'm exposing them tonight. So Iranius criticized them. He wasn't the only one. There was other people who did as well. Now, Origen of Palestine was a Christian, and he was a scholar. And in 240 AD, he created this document called the Hex Apla. I know that the word hex means six, like a six-sided uh, stop sign. The Hex Apla, but it really had eight columns. It was a manuscript that compared six Septuagint versions. Wow. By 240 AD, there were six Septuagint versions, including the authentic one from 250 BC. So there was also one Hebrew version of the Old Testament and one Hebrew word transliteration into Greek. So there were eight columns in this thing. This, this work was mammoth. It took him years. It consisted of 15 volumes, 6,000 pages. But it was lost when the Muslims burned the library of Caesarea. That was a city on, in, on the Mediterranean uh, this is where the, uh, uh, it was a city named after Caesar. You can read about it in Acts chapter 10. And the Muslims raided it in 638 and destroyed the library there, Caesarea. And I'm sure they shouted Allah Akbar when they did it. What are the Muslims afraid of? This had all the uh, books of Israel in there, uh, not counting the books of the Dead Sea Scroll. It would have been great if this library had survived, right? Especially this Hexapla. Now they have found some pages of the Hexapla archaeologists. So, this work contained both Theodotion and Achilles translations, the Masoretic text, and what scholars think was the original Septuagint of Alexandria. That's the one we're looking for, the original Septuagint of Alexandria, and there may be a clue of where it is, okay? So there are four versions of the Septuagint have survived, okay? Number one, this is Codex Vit uh, Vitanicus. This is from the same source and time period as Codex Sinaiticus, which is Sinai 
Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus, again, I don't know how you want to pronounce it, or 325. That's the second one. Codex Sinaiticus, about half of it's missing. They found this in St. Catherine's Monastery of the Sinai, which is, was belonged to Egypt at the time. It was found in 1844 by a guy named von Tischendorf, and it was dated to 325 AD. And these two books, Vatanicus and Sinaiticus, of the Septuagint, seem to be from the same uh, source. It was translated from something. It, they, they both appear to be translations of Hebrew text, not from the old Septuagint of 250 BC. Then there's this thing here, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. This was brought to Florence, Italy after the fall of Constantinople, the Christian uh, New Rome, uh, the last city of the Roman Empire in 1453. It had both Byzantine and what they call Alexandrian type. Alexandrian type was a type of writing that conformed to Alexandria, Egypt in the Greek. Then finally, there's this book here, this Septuagint, Alexandrinus, Alexandrinus, <laughs> however you pronounce that. 450 AD, it's a complete copy of the Septuagint. It was given first column place in the Complutensium Polyglot. Now this was a book similar to the Hexapla, but it was made by the Europeans, by the Catholics in 1657 by a, a cardinal. Now this version right here, this these old ancient uh, uh, Greek writings were donated to Charles I of England in 1627 AD. It was donated by the uh, guy who was in charge of the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, the bishop, or, or you call him a pope, I guess, uh, in Constantinople. He donated this to uh, uh, Charles I, and it was saved from a fire at the British Library, which used to be called the Cotton Library in 1731, by the librarian who is named Bentley. This contains both Coptic and Egyptian, Egyptian markings. Is this the real ancient 250 BC Septuagint? Does it say Viennus or does it say the other word for virgin? And uh, that's what we want to know. So Alexandrinus. Now, this all relates to the Dead Sea Scrolls because the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Isaiah Scroll, the, the scroll that survived, seems to be closer to the Septuagint translation that they have, these, these four, than it does to the Masoretic text, which tells us that the corrupt, the, the corrupt Septuagints, okay, uh, were corrupted by the rabbis to keep their synagogues from being split. And so the restoration of this old Septuagint as the dictionary uh, when the Jews of Israel find this out that they've been lied to, this is going to bring many of them, all Israel shall be saved into the church. Can you say praise the Lord? Well, that's where I'm going to stop uh, tonight. And uh, I just want to play this particular movie to help you understand the uh, changes that were made. Uh, this guy explains it, and I'll talk about it when he's finished talking about it. The process of textual criticism is taking the available ancient manuscripts, whether they be in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, and compare them to try and determine the original reading of a certain passage. We're going to take a look at Isaiah 7 verse 14, and in the King James Version we read, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now here is this verse from the, the Masoretic Hebrew text. Now the Masoretic text dates to about 1000 AD. And then here is the same passage that's found in the Isaiah scroll. The Isaiah scroll dates to between 100 BC and 70 AD. So it is about 2,000 years old. And here we have the passage from the Greek Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew Bible about 2,000 years old. When we compare these three manuscripts, we notice some differences. In the Masoretic text, 
we have the word Adonai, which means my Lord, but in the Isaiah scroll, it is the yod heh vav the Tetragrammaton, or, or Yahweh. In the Septuagint, we have the word Kurios. Now, Kurios means Lord. And this really doesn't help us in textual criticism because the Septuagint always translates Adonai as Kyrios and it always translates Yahweh as Kyrios. The next difference is the Masoretic text has the word Ha'alma, which means the young maid or young maiden. The Isaiah scroll has the same thing, Ha'alma meaning the young maiden. However, in the Septuagint, we have the Greek word parthenos, which means virgin. Now, the equivalent Hebrew word would be betula. The question here is, and which is often debated, is the original rendering of this verse ha'alma, the young maiden, or is it ha-betula, the virgin? It appears that the Septuagint is translating from a possibly translating from a Hebrew text that had the word Betula rather than Alma in it. The next difference is in the Mesoretic text we have Ve Karat. Ve Karat can either mean and she called or and you called. This conjugation can mean either or. However, in the Isaiah scroll, it's ve kara. Ve kara means and he called. So we can already see there's some differences here between the Masoretic text and the Isaiah scroll. Now, in the Septuagint, the Greek word is kaleses. Kaleses means you called. And this is much more specific than the Masoretic text. So in the Masoretic text, it can either be you called or she called. In the Isaiah scroll, it's he called. But in the Septuagint, it's you called. Then the last word we're going to look at here in the Masoretic text is actually two words. Imanu, which is a word that means with us. And then El. El is the Hebrew word for mighty one, or we usually translate it as God. So Imanu, El, with us, is God. However, the Isaiah scroll combines these two words together as one word. Now, whenever Hebrew does this, it's always a name. Whenever two words are put together, we, we know that that's a name. So here we have the name Immanuel, or as we normally say, Emmanuel. In the Septuagint, basically a transliteration from the Isaiah scroll, Immanuel. If we take a look at the Masoretic text and translate it literally, we have, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a maiden shall conceive and bear a son, and she, or you, will call his name Immanuel. In the Isaiah scroll, we have, therefore Yahweh himself will give you a sign. Behold, a maiden shall conceive and bear a son, and he will call his name Immanuel. In the Septuagint we have, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Immanuel. Well, praise the Lord. Um, he had things a little bit backwards. He thought that the Septuagint was quoting from a different version of the Masoretic text, when in fact what really happened was the Septuagint that the Jews created in 126 AD, the Septuagint of Aquila, Theodosian, Akiba, uh, that Septuagint is the one that changed it from Parthenos to Viannis, young maiden. That was the change that was made. Now he was comparing the Masoretic text that was found in the city of Tiberias, which uh, left the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, they took those scrolls and they went to Jamnia, then they went to Tiberias, 
Those are the Masoretes scribes that, that kept the translation of the Hebrew. The Hebrew is accurate, Hal Alma, okay? That's the accurate word. However, the original Septuagint of 250 tells us that that word means Parthenos, virgin. It was the new Septuagint of 126 AD where they changed it, and they did it to stop the synagogue splits, and they changed it to Viannis, meaning young maiden. And this kind of thing they did throughout the book of Isaiah. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially the Isaiah scroll, was discovered and handed to, to Israel on November 30th, 1947. And then there was a riot by the Muslims two days later, December 2nd, in Aleppo, Syria. They went to the great synagogue of the Jews, and they discovered there the Masoretic text, the, the, the crown, the keter, called the keter. This is the most revered manuscript of, uh, of the uh, rabbinical Jews. And the Muslims went on a riot, and they tore it, and they tore out the first four chapters of the Bible and half or two-thirds of Deuteronomy. And the portion where they tore it out were the 28 curses upon Israel for not obeying the Lord. I think God was speaking to Israel. And the rabbis are not listening, just like they didn't listen to Jesus and John the Baptist. And they've kept these people in captivity. Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, and all Israel shall be saved. And then when, they, when this event occurs, okay, there will be judgment on the whole world. It's the last sign that we're looking for. Well, God bless you. I hope you enjoyed the Bible study tonight. Stay tuned for next week. It's going to be even more interesting about the, uh, these, other, these other things. Uh, God bless you until next time. In Jesus' name, amen.